Hi all, I thought we can continue our look at the evolution of chess. I want to look at game 17, the size of game 17 of the match between uh, Bog Alexander Anakine and Bojolozhbov. So this is a rematch, which many people uh, thought there were stronger players, including of course Capablanca to rematch. But uh, okay, in this game we see uh, a very interesting um, thing happen in the Queen's Gambit accepted. D4 from Bogo. Alexander replied with the Queen's Gambit accepted, he took the pawn. Now nowadays White knows enough theory to be able to gain back the pawn quite safely but uh, this, what we're about to witness is a total disaster for Black holding on to this pawn believe it or not. Knight f3 was played, now if White was really keen to get back the pawn then a move like e3 uh, could do the trick and if black dared to play something like b5 undermining is very effective like this for example you know like this takes queen f3 could be a punishment so black usually doesn't cling on to the pawn basically but uh, Bogo was pushing his luck he played knight f3 and now we see knight f6 and again not e3 here uh, to try and get back the pawn immediately. Instead, knight c3. And now a move which shows that uh, actually Alexander might be keen to ho hold on to this pawn. Still, it's at some cost this, this move. Uh, as we'll see, that uh, if, if white plays. So, what black, pl black played was a6, as though he's going to hold on to the pawn with b5. And it's a bit of a cheeky thing to do this a6. And you might wonder, well, hold on, hold on, knight c3 did support e4, and then maybe e5, and if that's dislodged, there's a soft spot here, surely. And if black ever castled kingside, then say this knight was there, then h7 would be more vulnerable than usual. So maybe maybe this is a legitimate, you know, gambit attempt in its own right. You know, let Alexander Anakine hold on to the pawn with b5, and try and push for this e4, e5. Okay, let's see what happened, though. After e4... We saw b5 holding on to the pawn. Okay, and again, white could, you know, try and make a, a kind of positional sack with b3 maybe later on, but uh, he has to be very careful here uh, about the possibilities of, of b4 and, uh, you know, maybe taking on e4 later. And bishop b7 is a very good square for the bishop, striking across the diagonal. So white chose to get compensation with e5. So he is dislodging the f6 knight. Knight d5 is played, and now uh, a very aggressive uh, looking move which targets, it seems, um, f7 as well as vacating f3 for the queen, which could be useful for not only attacking f7 but d5 and the diagonal. So, is this very, very dangerous? Dangerous for Alexander Alakai. He wasn't that worried. He has to play accurately, though. He plays e6 first which does help support d5, not just the queen supporting d5 but the pawn now. Okay, but now we see queen f3 double attacking d5 and f7. But a precise move here from black is played. Um, it's not amazingly like a firework move, but I wonder if I could test you guys on YouTube. What does black do here to safeguard f f7? Uh, without having a problem with d5. Um, so what would you kind of play here as black? I think it's the absolute best move in the position. Uh, when I briefly engine checked this game. If I give you 10 seconds here, starting from now. Okay. Queen d7 I think gives give yourself like 10 points. If you played other things I think you'll end up losing points. Uh, if we just engine check how to defend f7 here, it doesn't seem... Okay, queen d7 looks like the strongest. If f6, you might wonder. e takes, queen takes. This knight takes d5 here. Uh, which could be nasty. It could, could lead to nasty stuff. So really, um, queen e7, just knight d5. So queen, queen d7, sufficient. So really, black is a pawn up. Now, 
in more championship standards to be a clear pawn up without too much compensation is, is rare because of the evolution of opening theory um, and you might think well hang on um, opening theory is not really evolution of style is it well I, I think really it's part of the game it's a major part of the game to get good position from the opening and really white has not got a brilliant position from the opening because not only black has the extra pawn black's like bishop issue which sometimes is an issue is not an issue here the queen is kind of committed the knight's kind of committed to stumbling around a bit so the opening hasn't been this this position has got the seeds of destruction here already for white and um, okay but white played knight takes d5 and after e takes there might be this possibility of e6 uh, black wants to blockade against e6 and also of course now there's the possibility of bishop b4 check how would white you know if white plays bishop e2 then bishop b4 check is white not going to castle if he plays like this then white would forfeit casting so really from an opening perspective this would be virtually unheard of in modern you know world championship matches to have such a disaster where you're having to play a pawn down after nine moves uh, and a poxy move like a3 which itself by the way is is a target as we're about to see uh, later on in the game it's it's a useful tactical uh, target first knight c6 again forces the issue from white white's not left alone here what does he do about d4 now does he move his queen to protect it he plays bishop e3 okay now knight d8 and white is left alone there's no immediate threat or is there is there this idea of knight e6 a lovely blockade well also now that knight's here and goes to e6 there's pressure on d4 which could be amplified later by c5 bear that in mind bishop e2 though and now again white is is um put on the spot here with this other ingenious move which actually is also something about knight d8 that it does mean that bishop b7 is technically possible with a protected bishop on b7 so this next move is actually facilitated by that knight d8 it's not just about the knight blockade on e6 dual purpose ingenious move is played now knowing that blacks a pawn up to the good he plays um, I wonder if you can guess it with uh, five seconds okay plays queen f5 letting d5 drop a bit of a trap and I think if Queen takes d5, we'll see the Queen trapped with Bishop b7. Nowhere for the Queen. So this is ingenious tactics now, but Alexander is showing a fine um, tactical pressure, being a pawn up to consolidate, to get rid of all the pressure from White, to just be a, a total pawn up. Not only that now, after Queen g3, we've, we've got here a Queen like locked in on the King side, you know, with limited targets, and a Queen which is able to infiltrate early into the white position if needed uh, it doesn't use that option at the moment h6 to kick the knight first the knight stumbles back to h3 okay and now we see not a queen infiltration move actually uh, we, we see c6 which reinforces d5 so you might wonder why, why play c6 why indeed why not something like queen c2 I think let's let's check this queen c2 might actually be an aggressive move I think the concern was was this this idea of knight f4 where does black have to play c6 there might be another tactical alternative you see like knight e6 computers are, are much more clinical if knight d5 here then, then taking on b2 okay so but c c6 is is a reasonable move as well and that was played okay the infiltration can wait for a moment and actually white doesn't do himself much of a favor with this next move he plays f4 which really deprives um the knight of that lovely f4 square well relatively lovely f4 square and now we see the infiltration queen c2 threatening to win another pawn but this is ignored by, by by go he plays queen f2 now if queen takes b2 is this this major tactical trap being set 
for the Black Queen being trapped? That, that's the big question here. But um, what we see instead from Alexander Alakoni is, is not the obvious, but a little bit of an unexpected move. Remember, this is 1934. And what's incredible is it seems to be a very clinical tactical move, actually, which, which Houdini likes. We're, we're in 2012. Houdini likes this next move. So this this is, you know, you can't take away from Alexander's tactical prowess uh, so far in this game. He's infiltrated with his queen, and he's not that keen immediately to take on b2. Can you guess what he played here? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, he takes on a3, believe it or not. So what is going on here? Why did he do this? Well, if rook takes a3, then queen takes b2 is a bit embarrassing. How, how does white actually defend that rook? He hasn't even castled yet. He can't get his other rook to defend that rook. Uh, very limited uh, defensive tries here. Bishop c4 is not doing much um, because all of this is kind of reinforced. You know, that's been reinforced from before d5 with the c6 move. So um, that that's actually not not played. White actually castles here, losing yet another pawn. Now actually if he took with the pawn then I believe check here is embarrassing. There's nowhere defending a1 now. So okay so white just loses another pawn. So this shows that really opening theory uh, was quite primitive it seems that even in a world championship match un un unless unless Bogo wasn't wasn't the greatest keenest theoretician around this time you know Max Erber which is the, what we're going to see in a, in a future world championship match he maybe he was a, a much greater opening theoretician anyway than Bogo or even you know Capablanca you know even though that was a restricted set of lines when when they played in in their world championship match at least there wasn't any major opening disaster that we're witnessing here because what we're witnessing now after Bishop takes b2 uh, looks like free connected past pawns now on the queen side without white even being able to play rook c1 that's the big improvement of getting the bishop involved you see if the black queen had munched with um, queen takes b2 would it be a case of having the cape but not being able to eat it bishop takes a3 is really engine approved <laughs> huge huge move to play bishop a3 queen takes b2 still it, it's it's actually pliable for black Bishop f5 or Bishop h3. As again, it seems as though White's struggling to generate compensation. Uh, but he might try his luck on the king side. Okay, basically, th there's a situation with lots of pawns over here. Whoops. Lots of pawns over here. It's not good. So this is even worse in the game. So you could say this is resignable or is is there going to be something to look forward to if the king castles over here well Alexander's not overly keen on stereotypical moves uh, he fits it into the position he, he plays bishop f5 okay uh, which means the bishop's actually very nice there it can come to these two squares potentially in fact after g4 bishop e4 now we see f5 and now knight b7 which prepares actually the option of casting queenside. So knight f4, black castles queenside, away from the potential issues with these pawns crashing through to his king position. So he's still got these three pass pawns ready to storm down the board. Queen g3. But now actually he plays a move on the other side, g5. He's not in a rush to move any of the pawns. Okay, g5. Okay, now after fg, fg, bishop d1 attacking the queen. He plays queen c3. Knight e6, it looks like a, an attacking move, but the rook moves. Now rook f6. So is white making any progress here? 
The rook's now double, prepared to double to kick that knight. So rook h e8. Where's the knight going? Goes back, knight f4. Okay. With knight f4, we've got a double attack on these two guys. This one is sort of protected by the bishop, but it is actually okay. Double attacked with rook and knight. But uh, knight d8 at least protects c6 for the moment. Uh, so one question here. In this position, can white actually play knight takes g6? Knight takes g6. Is that actually possible? What would be the refutation? Let's have a quick engine check of knight takes g6. Bishop takes, rook takes, move queen d3 hitting the rook. Alright, makes way for bishop takes d4. I think that's the main issue. And then e5 will drop. So I, I think it gets very unpleasant after that. So it, it's it's a bad position for white anyway. Queen f2 is played. Okay. And now queen a3. What does queen a3 do, you might ask? Okay, let's find out. Bishop f3. He willingly exchanges off light square bishops and he plays g5. Okay, so that pawn is not going to be lost for a moment. Now rook e6. Rook f5. White is just pawns down here with with issues really. Queen d3 and now h4. It's it's not that great without the black king on the king side. Rook g6 defending that pawn anyway. Uh, and there's also bishop d4 on the cards. h5 and now rook e6. So he's closed up that king side. So he's still got d4 now to under to attack and undermine. And he's keen to do that. Now that he's created that kind of free hand without worrying about these pawns, the attack on the centre begins with c5. Very powerful undermining of this pawn chain. Because if it takes, then either well, knight c6 looks very attractive, or even rook e5. So actually, rook f3 is played. White center is about to crumble to dust, it seems. Queen c2. After queen e1, now knight c6, putting huge pressure. Look at all of black's pieces here are, are undermining these two pawns. So white center is about to, to crumble. Rook 1f2, now queen e4, hitting g4 as well as the centre pawn. Knight g3, and now queen takes g4, winning another pawn. And now bishop takes d4. And here white had enough. So he was really munched. We, we wouldn't witness something like this, we would think, in, in a modern uh, world championship match. That uh, from the opening, it seems uh, black not only got an extra pawn up, but... Um, Lots of positional trump cards to go with it, which is which is very nice having the cake and eating it. The positional trump cards, you know, no bi no issue with uh, the light square bishop. Um, lots of pressure on d4 potentially. Um, that light square bishop exercising itself underneath the variations, offering d5, poison pawn. Now, in for more material. Soon, winning more material tactically, elegantly with bishop a3, making sure there's no, no rook c1 even. In no hurry to move uh, those pawns, he makes his king safe. Then he kind of makes sure white hasn't got anything really that dangerous going on to win these pawns on the king side. Now, once this situation is resolved with these pawns on the king side, that's the red light go ahead for starting to crumble white center. So now the pawns are fixed. White center is, is just crumbling as well as g4 is, is weak. So not, not a brilliant game uh, for Bogo this one. And it pushed Alexander one step closer. It was best of 30 to, to winning this rematch. One step closer with this win. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.